Hi there, and welcome to our winter wellness series. I have Dr. Zach Bush here, and he's going to be sharing some of his top strategies for staying well this winter. And our first topic we're going to start off with is talking about the flu shot. All of us are told this time of the year, right, to, to be getting our flu shot, but is that the right thing to do? So Dr. Zach's going to share his perspective. So Zach, what do you think about the flu shot? Fantastic. Yeah, this is one of the most bizarre pieces of scientific wackiness that you've ever seen is, is the concept of a viral flu vaccination. And, and if you, we back up for a second, take a look at the word virus, it is, carries all this fear in it. It's almost mm -hmm. nigh on to that word cancer, where we just automatically fear the word virus. We can't even fathom that, that the word virus is good for human health. And so we, we mount this fear around this one virus, which is the in influenza virus. And there's, you know, in fairness, there's many variants of the, the viruses that will cause this flu-like syndrome. Um, but, you know, so there's, you know, at any moment, a dozen or so of these strains of viruses that are sweeping from Asia across the world. And so to create the vaccine, they actually go to Asia. They map out the types of flu that are emerging in the Asian population in South Asia every year around, you know, end of our summer. And then there, there's this race to get that, that uh, end of their summer or whatnot, or end of our summer time frame to get that flu vaccine done based on which viral strains are coming out of Asia. Mm -hmm. And so they put that, those six strains, typically it's five or six that they put into what we call a flu vaccine. Well, there is no one virus it's against. And typically we see that the virus that ends up showing up wasn't even represented in the flu virus strain this year. And so you hear mm -hmm. that even on morning talk shows and everything else is we'll find out in February, oh, well, unfortunately this year, looks like the main strain that went wild across the, the world wasn't actually the one we were vaccinated against. Oh my gosh, that's And so crazy. it is crazy, it's a little <laughs> bit confusing. But then we really back up from there and say, well, what is this thing of viruses? It turns out that, you know, when we look at this thing called the microbiome, we, the bacteria get all the credit, right? So doctors have gotten used to talking about probiotics, consumers have gotten used to the concept of probiotics. And we find out now that probiotics are hurting us and that they actually are nigh on to antibiotics for keeping our, our, our uh, biodiversity low. It's another topic, I guess. But then if we back up and say, well, what, are the, what is the microbiome? Is it just the bacteria? And in the end, it's not even close. So 10 times as many species of parasites as we have bacteria on the planet. Mm. And 10 times that, at least, you know, so we're up in the 5 million species variations in the fungi. And then we go to the viruses, finally. And the viruses are by far and away the most giant kingdom of life on Earth. There's now thought to be 10 to the 31 viruses on the planet. That is a one wow. with 31 zeros after it. And we vaccinate to one of those. <laughs> 10 to the 31 okay. is a hard number to wrap your head around. It's actually 10 million times more than our stars in the entire universe. Not our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Our galaxy has around one and a half billion stars. And there's about one and a half billion other galaxies. So you multiply one and a half billion times one and a half billion, and you're still 10 million times shy of the number of viruses on Earth. And so now you think back and you're like, okay, so the doctors are telling me I have to have a vaccine against one of the 10 to the 31 viruses on the planet. Does that make any sense? And then of course it doesn't make sense. So then we back up and say, well, what is the proof that the, the, the vaccine works? And of course, this is not required by the pharmaceutical companies to do. And so unlike drugs, the pharmaceutical companies, because of a bunch of legislation that was passed by Ronald Reagan's administration in the late 80s, we don't have to prove safety or efficacy of these compounds before we put them into our children and adults. That's amazing, let me repeat. There is no requirement for the pharmaceuticals to show safety or efficacy of a vaccine. And so incredibly, we keep pumping these things into people saying that this is necessary for public health with absolutely no data that that's the right thing to do. So finally, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, paid for by your taxpayer dollars, did the big Cochrane Review study. A Cochrane Review is the gold standard of a meta-analysis, is the term in the science and scientific community. A meta-analysis is take all of the data, all of the clinical trials done on any subject, in this case, influenza vaccines, and let's figure out if it's actually doing any public health good. And what they found, first, you know, before I tell you those results, keep in mind that what you've heard is that the most important people that must be vaccinated are children, and geriatrics. Those are the vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. 
it turns out that the Cochrane Review goes on to show that there is zero impact on children and geriatrics. No measurable change in the infection rate of influenza after widespread vaccination of the population. Hmm. Did anybody benefit? And it turns out that one little section of people did benefit. It was only seemed to be males between the ages of 45 and 65. And I think this is partly because that population has a pathetic immune system. But 45 to 65 year old males, did they change the rate of influenza? No, they got exactly the same number of cases of influenza if they were vaccinated. The only measurable outcome in the entire Cochrane Review is those men had six hours less of symptoms of flu once they had contracted the condition. Six hours less, wow. and we've justified a multi-billion dollar tax you know, payer incentivized program that is lining the pockets of the pharmaceutical companies and people aren't allowed to go to work. They're not allowed to go into the hospital. You know, all of this ridiculous stuff. They can't go teach in a school if they haven't had their flu vaccine. And so we have been so indoctrinated into a fear paradigm around viruses, which is completely unbased in science. There's no rational mind that could say, yes, it makes sense to vaccinate against influenza in the face of 10 to the 31 viruses. And even then, we would say, okay, well, what is the, the proof of safety? None. What is the proof of efficacy? None, unless you consider six hours less of symptoms in a few men, middle-aged, then you think, okay, is it worth you know, putting this injection in all these children so that those men can have that benefit? I would say there's no rational state of mind that would say we should vaccinate those children or adults to flu. So let's back up again just to the nature as we think about winter what are we going to do what are we going to do to create a healthier environment and those i think are, are really where we should kind of be focusing our attention instead of bickering over should we take flu or not mm -hmm. really what is the root cause right exactly and so what are some of your best tips for boosting our immune system this year if we decide to not get the flu shot yeah so whether you get the flu shot or not you need to think okay this Certainly no case of, of flu has ever been caused by a lack of you know, flu vaccination. We, if you get the condition, it's because your immune system and the microbiome that constitutes that immune system was either unbalanced or just frankly deficient. Mm. And so what makes you prone to that deficiency? Certainly a challenge to the microbiome. So antibiotics in your food. This is a very important time of year to eat organic. The place you get most of your antibiotics in today is actually in your food and water system. And mm. the foods that are richest in the uh, chemicals that we grow in, the glyphosate or Roundup chemicals that we grow in, are going to be most represented in the root vegetables, which is, of course, exactly what we should be eating this time of year. The root vegetables would include things like sweet potatoes, turnips, beets. These are some of the most powerful anti-cancer compounds and everything else. We should be eating those. But if you eat a conventionally chemically grown root vegetable, you're getting very high amounts. Uh, the only other vegetables that could really compete would be something like non-organic kale. And so remember, when you're eating your winter greens or your winter root vegetables, get organic all the time or don't buy them. And so really, really get diligent. One approach to this that I think really does help this time of year is frozen. And so mm -hmm. frozen vegetables are a good idea for a lot of different reasons. They're picked ripe instead of unripe. Um, the, the stuff you get in the produce section this time of year when you're picking up something like you know, Brussels sprouts, and you think, oh, that's a beautiful stem of Brussels sprouts, I'm going to have that for Thanksgiving. Well, that was probably picked unripe in Chile and then trafficked here in a tanker truck with ethylene gas, and the gas would ripen that, that vegetable for you on the way in. Well, and when it's not naturally left in the ground long enough to actually ripen on its own, it's going to have a deficiency in nutrients, it's going to have all the wrong protein structures, and so it's just going to be less healthy. Is it bad for you? you know, just less healthy at least. Mm -hmm. If it was non-organic, now you got yourself a problem. So frozen organic vegetables, good thing to keep in mind this time of year, and then lots of root vegetables in the organic form. I really important to get those root vegetables in this time of year. Remember, instead of the spring salad, it's winter time. S stew the beets, get the turnips in there, Daikon radish is a powerhouse, huge root, goes all the way in. When I work on the farms this time of year, we were there in February, and all of the cows were pulling this huge, these huge daikon radishes out of the ground and eating those in the middle of frozen tundra of Minnesota, at nine degrees under, under freezing. It was just you know frozen ground, 
all of this blowing wind and they're picking these huge vegetables and eating them with all this nutrient rich density. So learn from the cow, learn from the foraging animal that knows when it turns winter, I need tons of fiber, I need those root vegetables, I'm gonna go after that, make sure they're organic. Mm, okay, so lots of organic veggies and then any supplements to boost our immune system? I know people say vitamin D, what, are, what do you suggest? Yeah, I'm a big fan of vitamin D this time of year. Um, once we hit September and at the 40th parallel here in Virginia or across the country, uh, 40th parallel will kind of go through Boulder, Colorado, give you kind of a sense as it goes west there. Anything at the 40th parallel and north this time of year, no matter how much you're outside, you can't actually activate vitamin D. Mm. The sun is too low in the sky, and so even if you're getting that direct sunlight and you say, I don't need vitamin D, you're literally in the solar winter now. And so you can't activate the vitamin D steroid from your skin uh, with that, that winter solace uh, state. And so you need to think about either taking those trips down into a, a more Mediterranean environment or, or get into the warm climate uh, south, Florida, or something like that, and get some daytime sunshine that way. Um, you know, tank up. You can get 100,000 units of vitamin D very easily in a day uh, outside. And so you can get an enormous amount. But uh, the, the capsules, I'm kind of in the fan of the 2,000 to 5,000 IU range. Take that a few days a week uh, throughout the winter time to kind of keep things boosted. Huge fan of some of the, the whole plant sources of vitamin C. I'm not a fan of vitamin C supplements typically, but a whole food source like Camu Camu is a good example. So you can get powdered uh, Camu Camu, uh, which is a, a root vegetable, very rich in vitamin C, uh, another good one to, to have in the tank and then support the microbiome. And so obviously I'm biased here, but I think the Restore <laughs> is one of the most phenomenal things because it actually doesn't try to do anything to your microbiome. It's not trying to micromanage it like a probiotic. It's not trying to feed a specific type of bacteria like a prebiotic. It's there literally to be the communication network between that microbiome. So how do you take Restore to really optimally protect your immune system in the winter? It really is into the ears. I love just mm -hmm. the, the outside of the ear, the external ear canal, and the nasal passages. So. That sinus spray is hugely helpful for this time of year to just maintain healthy microbiome, immune system up top. Quick spray across my face, look up, spray both my eyes, deep inhalation, both na nasal passages a few times a day, keep hydrated, and then outside of the ears, just a quick squirt in each ear. First time you do that, it's gonna be cold and surprising, you're gonna be like, that feels <laughs> terrible. And then very quickly, you're gonna get used to it because your body actually appreciates the hydration in the inner ear canal. I believe that a lot of upper respiratory infections come through the ears and not through the breath. And so keep, keep all of that stuff hydrated and, and, and the flora strong there. So those are some good tips. So the vitamin D, the Camu Camu, restore all over your face and ears and uh, gargle with it as well. So covering the tonsils is important as well. So if you're taking the oral a few times a day, you wanna tip the head back, gargle with that, cover the back of the throat and the tonsils. Coming out the back of the throat is the eustachian tube from the inner ear running back into the throat. That's how the, the virus can set up shop in a cracked, dried out ear canal, gets in, in there, and then suddenly it's moving across the tympanic membrane, and you've got it coming down the eustachian tube into the back of your throat, and now you have sore throat. Didn't start here, started here. So treat the ears, and then gargle with it to keep the tonsils, which is your biggest immune organ in the upper respiratory system, and keep that stuff covered up with it, and you're well on your way to a healthy winter. So best mm. of health to you there. Awesome, yeah, love it. Love that tip in the ears. It's one of my favorites, along with lots of organic root veggies and brilliant. Awesome. Well, thank cool. you so much, Dr. Zach. You bet. Lots more tips ahead. And if you want to learn more, go to intrinsichealthseries.com. Thanks so much. Be healthy.